Hi, welcome back to Power of Storytime. I'm Kate, the creative director of Colin Card Books and Z Girls Press. And every Wednesday at noon, we're reading from uh, children's and kids' books. Today, we're going to read a little bit more from the passage at Moose Beach. And every Friday at 5 p.m. Pacific time, we read from one of our books for adults. And this week, we are going to be coloring in our Jane Austen themed coloring book, A Quick Succession of Busy Nothings. So we'll be putting up a coloring page for you guys to color along with shortly, and we'll be coloring this on Friday and listening to a little bit of one of Jane Austen's books. Um, and we're doing this series to bring a little creativity and community to these very scary and confusing times. And we really appreciate all the support that we've gotten so far after reading the passage at, last, uh, at Moose Beach last week. Um, a few of you were kind enough to purchase some of our books, and we've got a few more packages going out today, so look forward to those books. And we do appreciate all of your support when you purchase books from us. It not only supports us as the publishers, but it supports our authors, the printers, and if you decide to purchase through your local indie bookstore, it helps them as well. So we can lift up the community together, and we appreciate all your support. And today we are lucky enough to have with us again, author Michael Foster, um, to answer some more questions about the passage at Moose Beach. So thanks for joining us, Michael. Hi, Kate. Thanks for uh, having me back. This was fun last week and, and I'm excited to, to be here again. Yeah, we're, we're glad to have you. It seems like everyone really enjoyed last week. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. That's great. So um, we've got a few more questions for you. Um, the Passage at Moose Beach has been compared to a couple of um, classic books like The Wizard of Oz, A Wrinkle in Time, Anne of Green Gables because of like the magical elements and the strong female lead. Were you inspired by any classic books or stories when you were writing this? Um, I was, you know, I read uh, uh, A Wrinkle in Time is, is actually one of my favorite series. Uh, I just I found it really magical reading it as a kid. Uh, I also, you know, read a lot of the, I, I, the, the books were this uh, Old Mother West Wind series, and they're always stories involving forest uh, creatures and, and things like that. Um, I think I probably drew some inspiration from the Xanth series from Piers Anthony. Uh, it was a fantasy series that I, I read a lot as a teenager um, because it takes place in a, in a world that's basically modeled on our own except a, a fantasy realm. Like Xanth is actually the shape of Florida and things like that. So I, I don't know. Very, maybe, very nice. I probably was inspired a little bit by that as well. <laughs> I love it. It's got that wild side element to it, which yeah. I think we're, we're getting to the wild side today, so everyone will get to see what that is. Um, and we, we haven't met him yet, but the biggest antagonist in the book is Grand Tree. How did you decide to make the bad guy a tree? Um, that is an interesting question. <laughs> I think uh, before I knew who or what the bad guy was going to be, um, I realized I, I had to have some kind of threat to this world. And... Uh, the idea came from, which you will get to, I don't want to spoil the book <laughs> yeah. too much, but there's a point where Alicia turns around and realizes uh, the water's missing, and why would the water be missing? And it kind of led to, okay, what, what uses the most water? And um, my time at the cabin, uh, the, the yellow pines were always the most interesting trees to me because they have this very unusual bark that um, you, you can just, you can pick off pieces like puzzle pieces and you'll find them scattered on the ground and they really look like puzzle pieces and you can, you can pick a piece off and then you can actually like set it back onto the bark right where you, you took it from and, and uh, it won't stay there of course, <laughs> hold off the bark, but definitely as a kid, it was something uh, I was always fascinated. Oh yeah, that sounds highly entertaining for, for a kid. <laughs> um, and then uh, my last question is, we're, we're about to meet him, but one of Alicia's friends is Mickey. Um, where did you get the idea for, for Mickey? 
so we have a lot of squirrels around our cabin and growing up we would just we would feed these golden mantle squirrels um we have chipmunks too and there's a definite difference between the golden mantle squirrels and the chipmunks uh and the the squirrels were the friendliest of, of the creatures but when i first took my wife valeria to uh to my cabin she was enthralled with the squirrels and just wanted to sit there and feed them all the time which she did for one particular squirrel who would fill up his cheeks run away and come back for more just for hours and she would sit there and really kind of develop a bond with the squirrel she could scratch him on his head oh. patting him on his arms and scratching his armpits and stuff the squirrel didn't care That's so cute um so on one of his return trips he brought with him a mouse and his mouse was dying um and the squirrel had it in, in, in its teeth and my wife and i were kind of horrified what is the squirrel doing with this mouse is going to eat the mouse and the squirrel arranged the mouse in front of us it just came in front of us onto our deck and then set the mouse up in front of us the mouse is dying it's got blood on his face oh gosh um, and, and the the squirrel set the mouse there and then came for food and we got the impression and it could be wrong maybe we're just anthropomorphizing yeah no, we're assigning human characteristics to the the squirrel um but we would swear that this mouse was an offering to us for all the food all the nuts that we would have been giving to it uh, because it had no more interest it left the squirrel there for us and then showed no more interest that's so interesting. So, and it, it's terrible and tragic, but because of the mouse, my wife instantly named the squirrel Mickey um, <laughs> because it brought us the mouse. Um, and so when I was looking to uh, name the character in the book, of course, my mind went back to this unbelievable incident. And... Uh, it just stuck so uh yeah that's that's where the name came from that's where the character came from that's so great sometimes life is truly stranger than fiction wasn't it <laughs> it was bizarre it was truly bizarre and i actually took pictures of the incident because i didn't think anybody would believe it so like no here's the pictures of the squirrel with the mouse maybe i'll share those sometime <laughs> That's so funny. Yeah, our, our cats have brought us little mice and things before, but I've never had a squirrel bring me an offer. <laughs> the same. I've had a cat bring me a mouse and leave presents for me. I had no idea this would even be something a squirrel would do. And again, maybe I'm misreading the whole thing. Yeah. But it seemed pretty obvious. <laughs> oh, that's so funny. All right, well... I think we're going to go ahead and jump in and read. I don't know, do you have time to read or do you need to uh, to get back to I work? would love to. Uh, unfortunately, this this time I won't be able to. I'm pretty busy with some, uh, some other work stuff I've got to take care of, but uh, I will be listening in while you're, while you're doing it. So uh, last week was great, and I look forward to hearing you this week. All right. Well, thank you so much for joining us. We're, we're glad you were able to come and answer some questions. And, uh, it's a pleasure. All right, we'll go ahead and uh, get into the passage at Moose Beach. All right. I'll talk to you later. All right. All right. So we left off on chapter three, stepping in. And Alicia has been spending time with her family and is feeling the pull of something magical. And we'll, we'll get back to chapter three. Hey girls, it's so beautiful today. Let's take the boat and row over to the beach on the other side. The water's calm and it's the perfect day for a swim. Richard looked over at his daughter and his wife, or sorry, his daughter while his wife Katie washed and dried the breakfast dishes. Alicia's father had made the most delicious biscuits and gravy from scratch. 
one of Alicia's favorite meals, and now she is resting comfortably with a full belly. What do you say, kiddo? Richard's goal wasn't the big tourist beach to the north. He had pointed towards the small, unassuming beach straight out from their dock on the opposite, undeveloped side of the lake. The water was shallow there, even several feet from the shore. It was perfect for wading, splashing, and whatnot, because it warmed so quickly in the sunshine. The best part of all was the temperature outside on this sunny day. I don't know, honey, Katie said cautiously. She looked to the southern skies. The clouds look way too dark. You know how quickly the weather can change around here. Mom, I want to go, yelled Alicia enthusiastically. It's so warm outside. I, and, and it sounds perfect. It's true, Kate. I think we can get there, swim, and get back with plenty of time to spare. We may have some rain by tonight, but it's still a long way off. Well, I don't trust it, Kate sounded dubious, and I don't want to start raining on my head while we're coming home. Aw, Mom. But if you two want to go, don't let me stop you. It's always good to have some father-daughter bonding time. She paused, holding the plate in one hand and the dish towel in another. Besides, I saw some new wildflowers starting to bloom out in the yard, and I'd like to try and sketch them with the afternoon light. Alicia's mother had recently taken up drawings, and she had a new set of colored pencils she was eager to try out. So you go and enjoy yourselves, but sweetheart, please keep an eye out on that sky and head straight home if you think you'll get caught out there in a downpour. Will do, honey. Thanks, Mom. And don't forget your life jackets, she called through the open cabin door as Alicia and Richard headed towards the dock. Rowing across the lake took about 15 minutes, and Richard watched the sky most of the way. Alicia knew what was going on, and um, Alicia knew what was going on in that head of his. Her dad would hate it if her mom was right. But it wasn't too windy. The distant storm seemed to be parked right where it was, so neither father or daughter felt that the from a distance, the beach was nothing more than a speck, a tiny white patch bordered on, bordered on both sides by endless green and the occasional brown of a fallen tree. I want to be a botanist when I grow up, the enthusiastic girl loved discussing her life plans with anyone who would listen to them. Alicia felt that familiar gaze from Richard when her parents would say things like, where did this small intelligent creature so filled with curiosity, imagination, and delight come from? She hated it when he talked to her like she was still a child. Her dad knew this, but he could not contain himself during these special moments with her. Alicia was enjoying herself and hoped he would not, not get all sappy and emotional right now. A botanist, huh? Richard was used to Alicia's ever-changing ideas about what she wanted to be when she'd grow up. After reading Jules Verne, she was going to be a marine biologist and invent a deep sea submersible. That way she could explore the deepest parts of the ocean and find exotic creatures. Yeah, or maybe a forest ranger. I wanna be able to explore this forest until I know it like the back of my hand. Alicia's hand was trailing in the water as she gazed over the side of the boat, looking for fish looking, lurking just below the surface. They passed a water lily and she let the wide green leaf slide through her fingers. A huge dragonfly had been perched on a large yellow flower that stood above the pad but it flitted away when Alicia's hand got too close. The bottom of the pad fe felt weirdly slimy, she thought. Alicia knew that her father had spent many hours over the years exploring the lands around the cabin. He liked telling her that it was this very lake where, she first, where he first laid eyes upon his beautiful wife. He said Alicia reminded him of when he and Katie were teenagers and would play with other kids from the campground. Alicia liked playing tag and hide and go seek, just like her parents did. She also loved to invent games, just like he said he used to, usually obscure and adventurous, concocted to fit the woodland setting. She would often ask her father to describe the kinds of games he invented and played them herself if she could. Most often, she liked to invent her own games better. Her father's time at the lake was all too brief back then. It was her mom's parents who owned the cabin. Her dad was only a tourist to this land. 
but for Alicia's family, a visit to the lake was an annual thing. Everyone knew her grandfather because he was a troop leader with the Boy Scouts and led camping expeditions around the lake. As part of the troop, Richard learned many of the tra traditional skills, such as building a campfire, tying knots, and creating makeshift shelters. He took Alicia, he told Alicia that his love of scouting vanished quickly once the first spark of love for the girl who would one day become his wife emerged. Richard's longing to return the following year and the year after that only increased. Alicia was only a few months old when she first visited the cabin, though naturally she had no clear memories of that herself. When she tried to recall them, the only thoughts she had were of the clear, vivid forest colors. Her father would talk of her eyes being wide at all the sights, thoughtful and contemplative, even at that young age. Alicia would smile and giggle baby giggles when they would feed the squirrels peanuts right out of their hands. Richard would strap her in tight to the baby carrier and off they would go for short hikes on nearby trails. Alicia appeared to thrive in the environment and Richard could not wait for her to be old enough for him to begin teaching her all the fascinating things there were to see and learn there. Dad, did you hear me? Spotting the shoreline of the beach, Alicia called out to her father, but he didn't respond. Oh, sorry, honey, I was lost in thought. I said we're almost there. Richard turned to look over his shoulder, and sure enough, the speck of beach had widened out to a shore measuring about 12 feet across. He looked for a good space to tie up the boat so it would not drift away, yet far enough away to avoid bumping against the small rocks nearby. Alicia stripped off her life jacket and flung herself over the edge of the boat before it stopped moving. She was already prepared with her swim shorts and top on, so she wasn't wasting any time. At 11 years old, she was a strong swimmer, and the water here was barely two feet deep. Richard had no worries about accidents happening. Don't get too away, far away from the shoreline until I can join you. Come on, Dad, I'm fine, Alicia said with impatience, moving further out into the water. I know you are, just let me act like the good parent I'm supposed to be. Richard finished securing the boat and then waded to shore, enjoying the warm sand on his feet. Stripping off his shirt and tossing it in alongside with a couple of towels, he stepped into the cool water to join his daughter, who was, of course, ignoring his warning and proceeding to swim out as far as she could while still touching the bottom. Now was not the time to raise a fuss, and he knew she could handle herself if she went under, which would not happen, he could get to her in seconds. They swam and splashed in the water for what seemed like forever. Their bodies became accustomed to the cold in no time. Richard would crouch down and have Alicia stand on his shoulders. She loved to clamber up, her wet feet slipping as they tried to gain a solid foothold on his wide shoulders. He would then thrust his legs to straighten them, sending his daughter flying through the air, landing with a splash several feet away. Bursting up from the water, she would laugh hysterically with joy. Do it again, do it again, she'd cheer. And he would over and over until they both became exhausted. After that, it was just good to relax and feel the soft water caress their skin. A drop of water landed on Richard's head and he instinctively knew it did not come from the lake. Dreading what he was going to see, he looked at the sky and knew instantly Katie had been right. The rain had arrived. Come on, Leash, let's get a move on. Maybe we can beat this storm home. Mom was right. Yeah, I know she was, he said with a somber, thoughtful look on his face. And I know Kate's going to be standing there with an I told you so look on her face. But we still had fun anyway, right? Alicia said slapping her hand on the water and washing the droplets intently to see if a rainbow showed itself to her. Definitely. Richard and Alicia slogged to the shore and quickly toweled off. Richard pulled on his shirt and moved to start freeing the boat from the log where it was secured. It seemed in the years that had passed, it seemed in the years that had passed since childhood, he had forgotten more about tying the perfect constrictor knot than he remembered. It was taking much longer than normal to undo it. Meanwhile, Alicia began scanning around the woods, hoping that she would see a deer or perhaps even a moose. 
but that could be a little terrifying being this close. As Alicia looked into the thicket of trees, something sort of tickled around the corner of her eye. Something seen, but not quite seen. Little movements that disappeared as soon as she looked their way. She kept trying to focus, looking for what she was missing, but unable to see anything. It, whatever it was, always eluded her at the last minute. What was it? What was she feeling but not seeing? She felt a chill run up her spine that was not due to the quickening rain. Goosebumps broke out along her bare arms and legs. The frustration of knowing something was there, but unable to grasp it, was slowly building inside of her. But she was determined. Alicia glanced back at her father, who was distracted with untying the boat, while simultaneously trying to keep it from banging against the rocks on the shoreline and the increasing wind and waves. She looked back once again at the depths of the forest. This time, instead of trying to focus so intently, she let her eyes go slightly out of focus. She looked beyond, and suddenly, startlingly, everything popped into clarity. She saw. Alicia stepped forward and in. And next is chapter four, A Daughter Lost. Richard eventually finished the task of untying the boat. The wind had really picked up and in the process pulled the rope and knots tighter than he'd remember tying them. Now it was time to get home before the first few telltale drops became the promise of a deluge. Richard wasn't looking forward to rowing back across the lake in this wind and turned quickly to Alicia to tell her to hop on board. Except Alicia wasn't there. Alicia? There was no response. Perhaps she had stepped behind a tree or was burrowing in a bush to grab a small snake. Alicia, let's go. Again, there was silence, except for the increasing rush of wind through the treetops, which buoyed the sense of urgency he was feeling about getting back across the lake before the storm really hit. Glancing up, Richard saw the sky darkening. The baby blue they had rowed beneath was now dark purpley gray. Loose pine needles were shaken free by the strengthening winds, drifting down around him, landing in his hair and making his head look like a porcupine. The temperature around him had dropped by a number of degrees. He was beginning to get irritated with his daughter. How far could she have possibly gone? The last thing he wanted to do was secure the boat once again and go looking for her. Alicia, let's go now, he called. Still, there was no response. The irritation slowly changed, and now the first tinges of worry were starting to creep in. There were, they were unwanted and unwelcome. Where could she possibly be? Feeling a sense of unease, Richard quickly set about the task of sloppily tying the boat up once more. Then he turned around and stepped towards the thick forest. Alicia, Alicia! Now he was really yelling, his eyes scanning near and far for any sign of his missing daughter. Raindrops were starting to reach his face, running off the back of his head and down his neck, but still there was no sign of Alicia anywhere. A lack of understanding mixed with worry and despair started to course through Richard. If this is one of your games, I am not amused. Come out now, he called, still holding the belief that she couldn't simply be missing. There was nowhere to go. The small patch of sand was bordered on all sides by almost an almost impenetrable wall of trees and bushes. And despite there being wild animals in the forest, none were a threat to humans, especially in the middle of the afternoon. Alicia, Alicia, Richard bellow over and over, his calls now filled with an urgent and growing sense of panic. He tromped through the bushes, never moving far from the shore, always keeping the boat in sight, just in case she really was playing one of her favorite games. The rain had picked up quickly and his shirt was soaked, the billowing wind causing a chill to set in. Richard's mind was lost in confusion. At this moment, he had a sense of everything in the world being wrong. How could a beautiful afternoon become such a fury of nature's blessed rain and sheer terror? He spun in circles, looking, searching, calling, yelling until his voice was hoarse. 
The full-blown storm could not compete with the storm raging through his head as he tried to make sense of this. Richard collapsed to the ground as the truth absorbed him, crushing him with his weight. Alicia was gone. All right, and I think we'll stop there for now. Leave you all at a little cliffhanger. So join us again next weekend. Well, I'm sorry, next Wednesday, we'll keep reading from the passage at Moose Beach and you'll get to find out what happened to Alicia. And also join us this Friday at 5 p.m. Pacific time for our little coloring session as we're gonna be coloring the page from a quick succession of busy nothings. Um, oh yes, and we'll, We'll be discounting this on our website. We have about 30 of these in stock and it's a fun distraction in times like this because it's um, 31 pages of uh, coloring book. So if you would like to get one of these, it's going to be discounted on our website, callingcardbooks.com slash shop. It's half price. It's going to be half price. It is half price. It is half price. No. With it's half price right now, and we'll also send you a pack of colored pencils with it. So if you don't have those, don't worry, we've got you covered. So thanks for joining us for Power of Storytime. We'll see you on Friday.